Well, hello, I'm Alastair McVoorn, and may I start out by saying how pleased I am to have been invited. It's an honour and a privilege to meet every one of you, and I've been trying to get round and meet as many people as I can, and it's, it's really a, just a great thing to be with intelligent, uh, interesting people that are engaged in similar things to what we're engaged in in Scotland. So it's a real privilege, and I... As, as despite being nervous right now, I have been looking forward to it for a long time. So thank you very much, and particularly to the Indigenous Language Institute and its personification here, Inye, for looking after uh, myself and on behalf of Finlay so well over the last few days. It's been uh, wonderful. So thank you very, very much. More and more and tang in our own language. Many thanks. More and tang. Right, so here we are. <laughs> And in a sense, and it, it, it just kind of turned out this way, it wasn't something that we worked together on. I'd like to think that what I've got to say can be quite supportive to what Finlay was on about earlier on. And although he's, his primary focus was the importance of adults, uh, my focus will be more on the younger generation. But as he said, the Gaelic medium educational system is absolutely crucial, although it needs an awful lot more, particularly support from the home. So we have the system, and so what I'm trying to do is support the system and get it to work a little bit better. And so I'll be doing, talking about the Gaelic medium karate classes I do, but it could be anything. It doesn't make any difference. Whatever your skill happens to be, if it's basketball or tiddlywinks or, or, or whatever it is, this is just an example. It, it's just from the limited skill sets that I had to choose from, this is what I came up with. But, you know, take it and uh, it's just an example of what I found to be helpful in our situation and perhaps it might be helpful to some of you in your situation. That's really all this is about and hopefully you'll find something interesting in what I've got to say. Now, <laughs> uh, being aware that perhaps Scotland might not be so important to some of you as it is to me, <laughs> to the point that you might not see it in relation to other places, I don't have a pointer, but in fact we're not even on this map. Uh, you see the United Kingdom, and after last month and the independent <laughs> referendum, I'm still heartbroken <laughs> that it still is the United Kingdom. But anyway, put that behind us for now. So we're the top bit. And right up in one of the most northerly countries in, in Europe. You know, as you can see, uh, in fact, it's the way the map is sort of set. If uh, reality had tilted a wee bit, and we're farther north really than... Uh, towards Iceland, and Iceland should be brought down just a wee bit. So uh, fortunately, because of the Gulf Stream, we have a very mild climate. And sort of in the winter, we don't get very, very cold. In the summer, we don't get very, very hot. So it kind of hovers a bit miserable quite often. <laughs> but, but there are nice days as well. And to put the focus more into to, to Scotland, uh, if you see the M in the Murray... Well, the end, more or less, in Highlands. That's not particularly far from where I stay. Probably about 10 miles or so. But I happen to work on the Isle of Skye. I have the privilege of working at Scotland's only Gaelic medium college where you can do a degree right up through BA, MA, MSc, PhD through the medium of Gaelic. And that's where I started the Gaelic medium karate courses. Now, just to fill you in earlier on, Finlay is from the Isle of Lewis. If you see Outer Hebrides, the top island there with Hebrides written beside it, uh, the most northern part of that is called Lewis, Ilan Lewis, uh, and that's where Finlay's from. So, so, speaking to someone earlier on today, one of the big differences in your situations, of course, is you've got many different languages, whoops, owing to many different nations. But with us, it's simply the one language. You know, that covers, uh, formerly in historical times, covered pretty well 98% of the country. And although there still are minor differences from place to place, we can all understand each other fine with a, uh, maybe the odd word might crop up from time to time, but big deal, you know. So we don't have that additional challenge to deal with. 
So that's where we are, and as far, what is it? The, the lines that they draw, the meridians of longitude, the, the flat ones, whatever those ones are. Uh, if you're familiar with, sorry? Latitude. latitude, what is it? The meridians of, lat no, meridians of longitude and something else of latitude. Well, the flat ones, anyway. If you're familiar with uh, the top end of Turtle Island, uh, there's a settlement there on Hudson's Bay called Churchill. And my house is almost on that same line as Churchill, which is the polar bear capital of North America, so I'm told. But it's not like that with us. <laughs> so that, that's where we are. Now, with regard to Gaelic in Scotland, some numbers that Finlay had referred to earlier on. In our last census, you can see there was about 58,000. A tremendous drop from even 60 years ago, but the turn of the century, let's say, that's 100 years ago. Uh, no, it wasn't, it's only 14 years ago, 114 years ago, forgetting which century I'm in. And as Finney was saying earlier on, Gaelic survived extremely well, despite not being in the school system. So it's an interesting sort of turn of events that now, where it is in the school system, we really see it disappearing at the community level. And uh, I won't spend too much time on this because uh, Finley has already talked about that. And he's a little too modest to say, but really the work he did with CNSA, Coral and Escultionari is absolutely fundamental to modern Gaelic development. It wouldn't be there if it wasn't for the work that, that he and his colleagues uh, about 25, 30 years ago did. And so that set up the Gaelic media. A Gaelic medium education grew out of it because parents put their children in the preschool uh, associations. And then when they got too old for that, they said, what are we going to do next? The next natural step was Gaelic medium education. And as you can see, you know, the closest figures to present time that I could get and be certain of, it's, the numbers are pretty healthy. A lot of room to move yet. Of course there is. But, you know, that's pretty good in comparison to 30 years ago when there was less than 200 children able to speak the language. I believe that the, when you started, it was less than 200 all over Scotland. So tremendous progress has been made there. Now, once again, sort of reiterating what's been said, although Gaelic medium education is fundamental and is extremely important, it's not enough. It does not, for all the reasons you've discussed earlier on, produce capable speakers of the language. And I see that all the time. The, the students, however well disposed, are limited in the topics they discuss, their accuracy of the use of language. It's just not developed in every possible way. Now, moving from the slide a bit, my work at the college often deals with people who've come through the Gaelic medium educational framework. And we've got one year to get them up to scratch so that they can do university level work. And that's basically the, the job of myself and particularly uh, a colleague, uh, Murdo McLeod, another native of the Isle of Lewis, uh, to bring that on. And that's our big thing because by second year, they've got to be able to to understand lectures, they've got to be able to uh, write essays and do their examinations, the whole thing at the degree level. Now that's a different situation than what uh, Finlay was talking about. He's talking about just uh, speaking and he's outside of a formal educational system, whereas at least at the college level, I, I work within that system. Now, however, uh, many of the people in the community around the college have children in Gaelic medium education. So it's apparent, quite obviously, that that needs to be supported. Oops. Now, one thing that's been a bit of a hobby horse for quite a while myself is that the curriculum used in Gaelic medium education 
is the usual English language one. It's simply translated into Gaelic and it's presented. So although the children are learning words and phrases and the rudiments of language, they're not learning to see the world in any way differently than are the English language students. And I think that is a, a major mistake in the system. Now, I spoke to the head of Gaelic language education in the government when it all started back in 1985. And the parents at the time wanted to have it that way because it was such a new and difficult step for them to make. My word, they're putting the, the education of their children on the line here. And so they were afraid to take too big a step. The one for language alone was enough for them. But heavens, we've moved on from that now, and I think people are ready to design a culturally responsible curriculum, whatever that form might be. And one of these things has to be some kind of a, an assessment, an idea of what cultural values to the Gaelic-speaking population might be. I know certainly some of the, the nations here on Turtle Island have been pretty clear about that, but we haven't been, and we haven't even any kind of a debate to even look at it. So that's a, a major step that I would like to see happen uh, at home. Uh, but how to get that going, I don't know. So I just keep telling as many people I can, and maybe at some point I get the opportunity to, to move forward on that. So the key to all of this is supporting Gaelic outside of the classroom. And so I wanted to find a way of doing that. And I also wanted to address the idea of cultural values, whatever the consensus for what those cultural values may turn out to be. And so, as I said earlier, drawing from a rather limited skill set of things I could do, I thought, well, what can I do? And I thought of the, the Gaelic karate classes. And at the time, I had a, a linguistics a student at the time. It wasn't a student of mine, she was a student at the college who was also involved, so there was two of us. And so we put the things in motion. And that was probably well over 10 years ago, and they've been running along uh, ever since. And at first, we did it at the college level. So it was the, the college students themselves that were coming. And then after that, uh, we thought, well, what about the Gaelic medium school that's a couple of hundred yards up the road? Maybe we could start with them. So at present we offer uh, classes for, the, for adults, but we also offer them uh, through the medium of Gaelic for the children. And as I said earlier, that happens to be the physical activity that I ended up involved with. But it could be anything. It doesn't make any difference. Just presenting it through the medium of, of the language is, is what's so important. And I believe some of you, like uh, Paul there, you've been involved with similar things over here in your language programs here as well. And you know, it's just such a wonderful thing to do. So simple, and you can involve adult speakers of the language who perhaps maybe don't have uh, liter uh, skills of reading and writing, well, as most people in the Highlands don't have. So it doesn't make any difference. And often those very people are the people who have such a wealth of language and idiom and expression, and also people who are steeped in the cultural values as well. So it's, it's a wonderful way of moving things forward. Now, just a wee bit of background of myself, if I can be excused, because it, it just sort of came together in this whole thing. And I kind of have two jobs. <laughs> One is uh, teaching the language, and the other is as a practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine, which I came through through the martial arts, by the way. That's how I got introduced to that. And for the longest time, I almost had the feeling that I was moving in two directions. And then, slowly, <laughs> it dawned on me that actually I wasn't. It was really the same thing, just from different angles. And my Anishinaabe friends in Canada understood when I was talking to them about this right away. 
but as 100% Shogunosh here, was sort of culturally incapable of reaching that conclusion at first. But eventually I got there. And the way I like to think of it is two overlapping circles. The bigger one dealing with language and culture, and the smaller one dealing on individual healing at a personal level. Because I look at the language loss and cultural loss as a kind of a, an imbalance. And in Chinese medicine, and perhaps uh, your own, I don't know much about these things, it's imbalance is the source of problems. So you're trying to get things put on the proper track, in balance and working together. And you can do that on a wide cultural level, or you can do it, and you should do it, on an individual level as well. And so, in a sense, the two things kind of came, kind of came together, although I didn't realize it at first. And in fact, it would be nice to say that I was a particularly clever person, and all these things you're going to hear were all thought up, and I thought, all oh, right, this is the plan ahead. But no, not really. I just sort of went with the flow and, well, to be honest, made it up as I went along, <laughs> because it just seemed to suit the problems that were coming up. So, and also with the martial arts, please allow me to try and escape from the stereotype. You know, you see these big tough guys, you know, on the telly and whatever, walloping each other and all that kind of stuff. Well, to me, that goes on the very top of the idiot list. You know, it's, it's so many people that I deal with in, in the clinic, they've lost their health or they've got troubles with it. And you see somebody who's big and strong and healthy, and they, they, you know, they've been blessed with all of that, and then they've got this wonderful body and they break it, deliberately. Now, that's just absolute stupidity. So I have no part for any of that. You know, use the, the art to balance yourself up, to try and be as healthy as you can, given whatever, you know, the, the creator's given you as regard to body. But don't wreck it. Make it stronger. Develop your potentials. You know, look ahead. Be positive. All of those kinds of things. So one of the very best teachers I ever had said, well, the whole point of it is to be happy and healthy. Because if you've got your health, quite often you are quite happy. And if you don't have your health, it can severely affect your happiness. So don't throw it away through stupid things just because you happen to be young and strong for a little while. But it's in the nature of people, especially young fellas, you know, mea culpa, <laughs> uh, in younger days as well, uh, to perhaps not regard that advice very well. And you get fed up with hearing about what strength is as well. You know, big strong guys can do big strong things. Big deal. What about people who are facing problems? And, struggle against those problems all the time anyway. To me, that's what strength is all about. You know, and I see many people here who, with respect, are older people, and I'm sure there's problems that come along with that, but you're still there, you're still teaching, you're still doing what you want to do. And to me, that is a far better definition of what strength is all about, rather than just big, strong people going around. Because that'll disappear, you know, once you get older, it'll disappear for us all. Right, so anyway, get off the soapbox. So what I'm going to focus on now is what I do with the children's classes in an attempt to try and support their acquisition of language and also to try and open their minds to other kinds of cultural values and ways of looking at the world. Oh, I wrote an awful lot for saying it as simply as that, didn't I? So you're spared that. <laughs> and with regard to uh, language issues, there's a few things. First of all, in Gaelic, we don't have a separate word for uh, yes and no. What you do is you repeat the verb, the action word back, positively or negatively. You know, did you eat breakfast? Ate. Didn't eat. Uh, Will you go to the party tonight? Will go, won't go. That's how you do it. 
But there is another word that kind of corresponds to something in English, and it's used wrongly as a default all the time. So we have to fight that the whole time. Uh, also, vocabulary. There's a range of vocabulary beyond the, the school, beyond the classroom. Introduce people to that. And even, but I'm always aware also that the vocabulary that I'm introducing to is in fact activity specific. So in a community, in a healthy community, there's a range of activities, particularly in the home. And so the more of this kind of thing, the better. I'm rather specific just to this one, but it's what I can manage to do. I also try and work on accurate language skills as well. Not that you go around correcting everybody all the time, <laughs> but hopefully you're providing good examples because the children just repeat. So if they keep hearing it right for long enough, they'll pick it up. That's how we all get it. It's time and repetition, repetition, repetition. And that also goes along with certain phrases and things. So this is the thing I was referring to with the yes and no. You know, in the English uh, sentence, it's I am, I am. But as you can see in the Gaelic sentences, one starts with us and the other one starts with ha. There's actually a third one that starts with sound, but it's different. And what happens is the second one there, ha, is used as a default for everything. That's completely wrong. And you can see the difference from the children that come from Gaelic-speaking homes. They don't screw that up. They get that right all the time. And you can see the people who haven't reached a sufficient stage in their learning, and that's the major thing they'll do wrong all the time. Even at the college level, you're listening to people in their third and fourth year, and that's the one you have to be careful with. So that really has to be hit. And easily fixed. Easily fixed. Did I jump a thing here? Okay. And the, the way that it fix it is uh, playing tag or tig. A little bit more to say about that uh, later on. Uh, well, jump ahead here. Now, I don't know what you say here. You know the game where you touch somebody and then they're it, and then they run away, and, or, or sorry, they come after you. But in, in Scotland, it's tig or tip. Is it tag here? Yeah, well, that's it. Because one thing is another thing. Are you it? So that's all s things. They're not ha things. So we play that an awful lot, partly because the kids really enjoy it. Gets them all running around and, and having fun. But, and again, it's essential that there is an, uh, an adult, or at least an accurate speaker of the language there to keep things right, so that they keep using the correct forms. Tu sais, mi cher, and you tu sais, can yes, tu sais, da kesh ne, can yes, tu sais. It's just all these are used and all this kind of stuff, but with that particular form of verb. And we have to do that all the time. Even if there's uh, over the summer holidays or Easter break or some sort of thing, it flips back to this wrong verb that people use. And so we always, always, always have to go back to that. And after a while, it fixes itself very, very quickly. In the beginning, yeah, it takes a lot of repetition, but then people get it. So it's just, it's essential to have a capable, better adult, because then the children will look up to them a bit, and a capable adult speaker of the language to s steer them in the right direction through constant repetition. Not by hitting their fingers with a ruler or something like that, that maybe happened to, to, to some of you and me and all this kind of thing, but no, but to steer it in the right direction. And that is a major accomplishment if you can get the kids using this instead of the other verb, ha, and you do it through TIG. Now, the other thing that, that came up recently uh, was we had a lot of behavior problems. Now, how are you going to deal with that? And I had the privilege of being in Hawaii a couple of years ago, and, and the Hawaiian schools, maybe some of you know, they gather outside the school and they sing an I'm ready to learn song, 
uh, the, the, the teachers come out and they sing it essentially, I'm ready to teach song, and then when the two are together, right, then everybody goes in. So at the same time, I'm sort of thinking back to the, the college and sky and a dark, February morning and the, the wind is hot, driving the sleet and the rain horizontally and you're just slapping you with painful, you know, you know hailstones and all that kind of stuff and uh, singing a little welcome song of, you know, I'm ready to learn now, you'd be very unpopular. <laughs> it wouldn't work. The weather's just not there. But the principle could still be there. So, so to try and address the behavior problems, and also with language hat on, to get yes and no correctly, we, I started, start every class with asking them a couple of, a few questions. And are you ready? And that requires one yes or no, actually, response. And then, will you listen? I, I've abbreviated it there, but it's will you, will you listen to your teachers and to your parents, etc. And then hopefully, get, hopefully they'll say yes, but it's a chance for me to give them the proper yes and uh, no, re well, preferably yes response so they can get that right. And then, will you try your best to learn? Again, different verb, different yes. So the ones who are strong in the language, generally from a Gaelic-speaking home, don't have any trouble with that. But the ones who aren't, you have to prompt them. And little by little, with everything else, repetition, 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 then they get it right. So you've, in a sense, not so much taught, but imparted the lesson that, and strengthened the idea that yes and no is different from English. So it's a way of pushing that through. Now, another thing with, which often comes up, and that's restriction of vocabulary. Because, you know, I'm lucky I can use Gaelic at home all the time. So I'm kind of used to using it. But with the ones that are just using it in school, it's surprising sometimes the simple things they don't seem to know. Frequently, it's outside stuff. And just a bit of a, a, a side road here. Sometimes in the college courses, I take people out, and not that I'm particularly good at plants and all that, but I've got all the main ones. You know, take them and we do environmental stuff, and I, I just, you can hold the plant in your hand and say what it is. And then people can learn these kinds of things. And I remember there was one, when Finley was talking about people wanting to translate all the time. I, I can't remember what the plant was, but we'll say it's Gunnerst. So I had the thing, it was there. And he said, well, you know, De Ahoun, what's that? And I say, she Gunnerst Ahoun. Yeah, but, but, but what is it? She Gunnerst Ahoun, but what is it? So she supposed to said that bit in Gaelic, but what is it? And it dawned on me, what she was saying really, what she meant really by saying what is it was, Gegawabamin <laughs> Minawa. One or two Ojibwe lines that I've learned. Anyway, what she meant was, what is it in English? That was the only thing that was real for this person. Just, it's, a, it's a mindset switch that has to happen, even though the plant was there. You could look at it. Who cares what it's called in English? That's what we call it, and you're up with us in the Isle of Sky, so call it that. But she had to get it in English. That's odd, I suppose. And then I think, was I like that once? Maybe. <laughs> anyway. So, in the, in the class, it's surprising the, the things that can come up. And there was one instance, a uh, poor fella, and I'm not making fun of him in any way. It was a, a very young child that came to the class. He was only six or something like that, and didn't de wet himself. And of course, sensitive fella here never noticed. So I'm walking along, and the next thing I'm going, splash, splash. Well, that's odd, you know, because you're barefoot. <laughs> and idiot here looks up, thinking there's a hole in the roof. <laughs> You know, in a gymnasium in a school, there's not going to be, you know, there's, not, there's floors above it. There's not going to be a hole in the roof. I'm not in a barn, but that was me, you know. And then one of the other little girls points down, and I, I realized what was going on then. But they didn't know how to say that. They didn't have the word for urine, or pee, or whatever they wanted to go. They, they didn't have that. Even the ones that had very good Gaelic. 
And, and I said, well, Kherson, Kherson You know, why? Why don't, why don't you know that? And the little boy looked at me and said in a teacher's voice, oh, but that's inappropriate. <laughs> well, no, it's not. <laughs> it's just what it is. <laughs> and so things come up and you, you just deal with them as they come along. So it was an opportunity whether... The, Fortunately, I've been talking about repetition. That hasn't been, been uh, repeated again and again and again in the class, I'm happy to say. But at least it was an opportunity for it to come up, at least. Because all of these things, they reflect real life. You know, and what Finley was talking about with working with dolls and stuff in the morning with children and all that. Well, you have to learn those if you're going to... Well, everybody learns them normally. So it's a matter of just creating a situation where you can learn it normally. Um, so anyway, that was as close as we got to it. And there's loads of other examples, but that's one. Now, one other sort of common word that, that surprises me is bra. It means a slope, the, the side of a hill, you know, slope. I have two classes, one in Skye and one in the mainland. The children don't seem to know that word. And I, now, granted, I do live on a hillside. As soon as you walk out the door, if you took too, too long a step, you would tumble back down. So I'm quite used to using the word dry. But it's just an example of simple outdoor things that people don't know. And I would imagine that for you know, nations who are so intimately associated with the land as your own, these sort of things would be really important. You know, and in the modern sort of class environment. Well, these things get lost. That's been my experience anyway. And also body parts. And because it's a physical thing that we're doing, you can do those because you move your head, you move your arms, and you, you say the word and you do it. Even if you don't really understand what's going on through repetition and the same topic coming up all the time, people learn these things. And the same thing, restricted vocabulary. People seem to know things like uh, head and arm and leg and for some reason they all know knee but they don't know sort of elbow, shoulder, ankle uh, things or other things as well and so because it's a physical class where we're exercising these things you get the opportunity and you can just with repetition, with repetition eventually they all get it I'm just thinking about the repetition I was thinking of a little boy earlier on today who he always wanted a piggyback. So he'd come up, he'd come up to the end of the class because we, we were in a gymnasium and then we go back to the care center where they stayed where the parents collect them at the end of it. So he's always come up to me, this little guy going, piggyback, piggyback, piggyback. And I don't use English. And if they speak to me in English, I just look at them quizzically and somebody will put it in Gaelic or they'll switch to Gaelic. I, I, I don't use English. So... <laughs> He kept coming up to say, piggyback, piggyback, piggyback. So I said, Kasagolachan, which is the Gaelic word for the same thing. So this went on for months. Piggyback, piggyback, Kasagolachan. Piggyback, piggyback, Kasagolachan. And finally, it must have been six, eight weeks, the little guy looks up and says, Kasagolachan, Kashmaha. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> but boy, that was a struggle. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing you have to do. And if I hope it worked. I hope he remembers it. It was pretty good for me because I had to learn that word. I didn't know it at first, but fortunately one of the uh, people that was assisting at the time made a phone call to her mother in, a, in another part of the island and said, what's the word? And we found out. So I learned it at least. <laughs> so, can you? Now, another thing that, uh, that we work on a lot is that Gaelic words can change at fronts of the words and the back end of the words. And... After little words like to, from, under, this kind of stuff, the, with the the in it, and we tend to shove the the in it all the time, when, when, even when it isn't there in English, uh, these fr frontal changes have to occur. And they, it sounds weird if you screw it up. So you can teach those. But you don't have to think it all out. Like, this is all retrospective stuff. I thought, what? Well, I didn't set out and say, okay, I'm going to teach the date of case and then think up a bunch of things to do that. No, I taught the movement and then I thought about it afterwards and realized that that particular thing was coming through. 
And the way I did that was we've got a whole bunch of traditional moves with interesting Okinawan names, and I speak Zip Okinawa. So I thought up stuff that the children could remember. And that's the way it sort of worked out. So there's a movement, common, common, I won't, I won't do the waist down part, I'll just do the arm part, that in karate is called Gedan Barai. But I wanted to make it fun. So what we did was the hedgehog goes up the hill and he rolls down the bray. So he goes up and he rolls down the bray. So brai turns to avrai. So suez, I guess, rolakushi is avrai. Be granyak dal suez, so rolakushi is avrai. It's got a nice sort of rhythm to it. And then the onomata piek, it sounds like it is sort of thing. They pick that up really quick. And then they get the phrase just without having to teach it really, by demonstrating and you're actually doing it physic physically. So that's one example of one of the moves. There's four basic moves that, that karate involves. And another one, it has another name, uh, what is it now, Uchiuke. So that's all right. But again, it's a fancy name in Okinawan. Kids aren't gonna care about that. <laughs> so it's more fun to do the rabbit goes into the hole, out of the hole, into the hole, out of the hole, into the hole, out of the hole. Works fine. They have a, lots of fun with that. And you teach that particular form that I've explained in there, but I won't bother with, with you right now, where that's an important one to get right. And they just do it. And then there's another one we do with this other one here where you go up and then you come down, up and then you come down. It's got another, again, it's got its fancy Okinawan name, but I thought, well, what are we going to do with this to make it interesting that the children will learn it? And so what we do is the birdie goes up and flies and then goes splat. The birdie flies and then splat. And then you can change it. And if we're, we're always in a circle. That's another thing I didn't explain. We always, I don't have any time for this boot camp style sort of thing. So we work in circles because circles with us, as I'm sure with many of you, are part of Gaelic culture. I know of a fisherman who well, he's not a fisherman, his father was a fisherman. He used to always go out with his boat, make a circle sunrise before he headed out. That's how important it can be. So we always work in circles. So we just pick the person's name. So you can say, you know, in, in A is flying and then splat. Jerry is flying, splat. <laughs> and they think this is the funniest thing if you can include the name, particularly mine, you know. Alistair flies and splat, which is exactly what would happen if Alistair tried to fly. But it makes it fun and they have loads of things. Uh, they like using their own names and thinking of people going splat. And there's another one at the, at the end, Uchiuke. Again, fancy thing. Now, I couldn't think up anything for that one, so it's just up into the air, and then boing, and they love shouting boing. So <laughs> you can, so we wove the physical patterns that are absolutely fundamental in karate into little phrases that are fun and the children can pick up really easily. And hopefully, given repetition and time, then being used to that pattern will eventually sort of osmosis-like move out into other parts of the language. And one thing that does happen in the adult classes where I don't do stuff like that, I often forget the Okinawan name. And what's the one I remember? You know, hedgehogs rolling down braes and rabbits going into holes and things like that. So uh, they work pretty well even for me. So maybe I should be doing them in adult classes. Right. Oh, and I just went over without following the thing. Sorry about that. And <laughs> one other thing, too, is that this is came up just when I was putting this together. I guess I was kind of tired or that, all this kind of stuff, so I skipped a bunch of them in the class. And a little boy comes up to me, and he'd only been there once before. And he says to me, oh, he didn't do this, and he didn't do this, and, didn't. and he named them all. In one class, he had learned them, and I missed it out. He was disappointed. And so it was a lesson to me. I didn't, just because I was kind of tired and all this kind of stuff, I didn't put myself 
into the place of those children who had come to the class. And that's what they were looking for. And so uh, that was a lesson for me, you know, just shake it off and do it because they appreciate it. And that's what they're looking for. Oh, and <laughs> this is another one they get a laugh out of. Uh, the basic punch is sort of aim for the middle, and you know, like that. So, what did we think of for this? Well, we thought one arm's out, and the other one's coming for a kiss, and then runs away. So he comes out for a kiss, and then runs away. And once again, they think this is absolutely hilarious. And it teaches the basic movements, no problem at all, with lots of fun. So it's Gia Nersen Park, I guess, Riecher Falov. Gia Nersen Park, Riecher Falov. And it almost becomes like sort of a mantra, all of these kinds of things. And it was the, the girl that was working with me at the time, the linguist, who would have think thought of these things, rather than the historian, who happened to be, speak Gaelic and ended up, because the only work was around teaching Gaelic rather than history. So she picked up on this, that the children were, were learning the, the thing like a set sound very, very accurately. And also stances are really important as well. Uh, because it directs, if your feet aren't right, you're going to fall over. <laughs> Put it quite simply. And there's various sort of ways of standing. Uh, so again, how do you get this across in a way that's fun and they can understand in, a, in an instant? And there's one where you're leaning forward, uh, kenkutsu dach. But it's the same thing as if you, if you were pushing. So. That's what we call it. Uh, so we, we, th we think of it as, as they're pushing against each other. Another one, which is called uh, kokutsu dach, you just switch and you, your, your, your weight goes back onto the back leg more than it was in the other one. And it happens to be an efficient, as you'd expect, uh, stance if you were pulling. So we get a rope or a belt or something and put the kids on either end of it and they pull against each other. And that's how they learned to shift their weight properly. And it's, so we call it the tug of war stance. And I don't have Gaelic for tug of war, so unfortunately I do have to use that term. So anyway, so that's the tug of war stance. Teaches it easy, fun, and in fact, with the older ones that I think a little more about stuff, you can experiment by deliberately not doing the stance right and seeing how far that gets you, which isn't very. And there's another one uh, that everybody will know which, uh, called Kiba Dutch, where you're to the side. And so we call it the motorcycle stance. The children thought that one up themselves. You know, the, the usual explanation is horse riding stance, but not all of them have anything to do with horses, <laughs> other than pictures in a book. So, but everybody seems to know what a motorcycle is, so that's what they do with that. Now, with regard to culture, too, Going back to what was said earlier on, that the problem with the curriculum is it's the standard English language curriculum with Gaelic stuck on top of it. So what are you going to do to teach some cultural things? Because if your thinking process is entirely English language thinking processes and all the cultural values that come along with that, you may as well speak English. Why go to the trouble of putting different words on something that's perfectly adequate already. You've got, I think at least, there's got to be something additional to that. And that's where the cultural values, I think, come in. So, however, I don't want to put, overemphasize that. Because the Gaelic medium teachers themselves, although they're working with this English-based curriculum, they're still people. And a lot of their their feelings, their personality, their own culture is going to come across anyway, just by virtue of who they are. So I don't want to paint it sort of black and white. It's, it's, it's no good. It's, it's not like that. But despite the problems with curriculum, there are some things that come through anyway, owing to the, to the teachers themselves, to their great, great credit. Now, we don't have anything, as far as I'm aware anyway, so sophisticated as the seven grandfathers teaching uh, uh, that the Anishinaabe have. 
But correct me if I'm wrong, but they are related to looking at the world around you a little differently than perhaps modern people do. Well, what's the, what would be a good phrase for that? They have their own cultural way of looking at the world. And I don't think most English language speakers, particularly urban ones, maybe rural ones on a farm would be different, pay a lot of attention to the environment uh, and what's going on around them. So although we don't have something as sophisticated as the seven grandfathers thing, that doesn't mean that we can't start to look around and see lessons that are around us. So I started thinking then, you know, many of us, uh, and I'm just talking about the Gaelic speakers, do have a strong collect connection with the, with the land as well as our language. And in many cases, the sea as well as the land. Like, my own people were landlocked. So I don't know anything about the sea. I could recognize it when I see it, but that's about it. But whereas Finney there used to go fishing with his father all the time because, you know, he had to. <laughs> so there's this strong connection with the environment that, that happens to be around you. And many of my older neighbors, uh, and older relations, many of whom aren't with us now, although they might not have expressed it as having respect for the land, the way they acted, the way they did things, did show a, a deep understanding and respect. Because there's all sorts of things you can do, like different kinds of weeds in your field, you can spray them. But my neighbor said, no, that's going against uh, nature. And the sheep in the area would eat them, so put the sheep in, let the sheep eat them. And then you haven't poured all of this poison on the land. So the little things like that, and they all added up. And over time I realized, well, wait a minute, these people are working close to the land. They do have a deep respect for the land in a, in a similar kind of way. So in addition to the things we've been talking about, to try and place the language in a cultural concept, I thought up stuff. <laughs> And this has to do with people, everybody likes to get an acknowledgement of some sort. So at the end of you know, a term or something like that, it's nice to give somebody something, some wee prize, some sort of acknowledgement that they've been working hard and learning and coming forward and all this kind of stuff. And the usual way you do it in the martial arts is belts or sasses or some sort of pat in the head like that. But I don't know, with the little guys, they're not moving through the usual curriculum. They're just playing games, having fun, and learning things, and all this kind of stuff. So I, I never really liked the belt system much for the really young ones, because it costs money, and what are you getting out of it anyway? So I thought to myself, well, what about a system of symbols? Symbols that are culturally appropriate to our own culture, and then you can use them to maybe teach a little bit as well, and to start the process of thinking about yourself and the environment and are there lessons in the environment around us. So anyway, this is what I've come up with. So I thought about different animals. I'm feeling a wee bit guilty I left out at plants, but oh well, it's not set in stone. <laughs> and I thought about ones that are frequently come up in stories and songs and poetry. Well, with us, songs and poetry is the same thing anyway. And the common ones are cat, deer, bull, wolf, salmon, and eagles. Now, cats go a long way back. Like, uh, the Gaelic name for the, the county that I live is the province of the tribe of the cat. So, and there's loads of other images and things about cats. And, what do cats do? Well, they are extremely, as you all know, good fighters. But if you scare a cat, the first thing it does is run away, which is only sensible, especially when you're only six <laughs> and that big. So as well as teaching the other things, for the first term then, we talk about cats. And I ask them what the cats do and what happens if you scare a cat. And they end up coming up with the idea that despite how skillful they are with their claws and all this kind of stuff, they run off. 
which is the best self-defense thing for anybody. If you can escape, escape, you know. <laughs> no problems then if you get away, problem over. So then they think about that. Rather than giving some sort of, sort of false sense of security because you've learned one or two things and you can kick a pad. So use that as a cat teaching. And then the next one that, I, and these are completely arbitrary, I'm just trying to get points across and using the, the animals as an example, is deer. Deer are absolutely through all of our songs and poetry and stories and history. And many people still uh, hunt the deer. And they're symbols of loads of things. So we think of them as strong and fast, and, and they're sort of, uh, if you look at the derivation of the word in Gaelic, fiag is a deer, but fiaich is wild, like a wild place. So they are kind of, even in the sense of the word, a symbol of the environment and a healthy, strong environment. So get people thinking about that. So that's like the second term. And I've only have six of them because after three years of the little kids classes, if they're still interested, they can go on as junior members of the adult one. So really, I'm just looking at the first one. So we can talk about all of these kinds of things and respect the environment, expect, respect different animals. And certainly in Skye and, and, and other places, we've got a wonderful environment that, that they can take their ideas from. Uh, tarav, or a bull, well, it's kind of hard to find a single, a bovine. <laughs> you know, cows are really important in Highland society. They say the oldest words in the Gaelic language is uh, croch, ku is bull. Uh, a hill, a uh, dog, and a cow. And what do they represent? Well, they represent wealth and sharing because we use the hides, we use the meat, we use the bones, we use the horns, the whole thing, you know, similar to deer actually, but it's a matter of sharing things. And I always, I've always found in life that the people who really have a lot of knowledge are always really good at sharing it. The people that are really careful and keep it all to themselves usually don't have very much. That's why they're keeping it. <laughs> Unless it's sacred knowledge, that's a different thing. But in appropriate circumstances, people are to share. And that's what we're doing, you know? They're teaching me things by, well, what, in, in their own kind of way, and, and I'm teaching them things. So it's a, it's a sharing kind of thing, and we're working with each other all the time as well. And that's a sharing kind of thing. So that's something that's well worth learning for all stages of life. And then the wolf. Now, I've stolen a wee bit from the Anishinaabe here, you know, representing humility because it's a pack animal. It always puts the good of the pack ahead of itself. And putting the good of the community or your neighbor is absolutely fundamental to Highland life. Uh, in the past, people always worked communi communally. Okay, like every vibrant community everywhere else, people would fall out and all this kind of stuff. That just happens. But when it really came down to it, work had to be done together because you couldn't do it any other way. And that's well worth remembering in Highland society. And often when people move in from the outside, they don't see that this individual thing, and you can see it physically represented with big fences go up all around the house and all this kind of thing, and that's not the way we work, not at all. You know, quite often people don't even lock their doors, and you go visit somebody, you just walk in. You don't knock and wait, you just go in if you know them well, because that's what you do. <laughs> so there's that kind of idea as well, and I'm getting wee notes, so I better hurry up through. So <laughs> the teaching about humility and working with others is something I'd like to get across as well. And the salmon, in our own uh, Gaelic culture, the salmon represents knowledge. And particularly because it's under the water, it represents knowledge that comes from the inside. And the modern school system tells you to disregard all of that and only take knowledge from the outside. And that's valuable. There's obviously things to learn there. 
but it's also good to be introspective and see what comes out from the inside. So at that stage, and that's what I would, we would be talking about for that kind of thing, to bring recognition to that part of themselves. And also, of course, sharing. And then finally, uh, once again, I'm kind of borrowing a wee bit, <laughs> uh, the idea of the eagle flying so high. So I took it to put across to them that you're allowing your potentials to come forward as much as they possibly can so that you can develop in your way. So if someone isn't as physically capable as someone else, as far as I'm concerned, as long as they're working hard and coming on, I don't care. It's their individual progress that is important. And everybody has something. I remember one time I was at a seminar with a very, very good teacher from Hawaii, and I was working with a fellow who was very, very much overweight, and he was feeling kind of embarrassed about it. And the teacher noticed this, and he just grabbed him by the shoulder, and he says, look, you're heavy. That's fine. You have things that other people can't. Learn how to use that. Don't knock yourself for it. Learn how to use it. And I thought, wow, pretty smart. Because we're all different. Some of us are tall, some of us are short, some of us are thin, some of us aren't. Big deal. Work with what you've got. And that was well worth learning. And that's the final stage that I was thinking about in this little cobbled together ideas that I put together. Right, so the ideas then are based on trying to get the language outside of the classroom to broaden its range of use and hopefully to reinforce a personal connection between language and the individual. So it's of value to them, it's not just a subject they do in school. Although having said that, they do kind of see what I do as another subject. It just happens to be outside of school. You're still battling the wind on that one. And also, have fun. Have fun through the language, not simply just schoolwork. Although, having said that, school nowadays is an awful lot more fun than when I was in primary one. I tell you, you know, sit up straight and don't move it. They don't do that anymore. They do have fun. But you can still have other kinds of fun. So that's what I'm trying to do with it. And... As I was saying, any activity could do it. And the nice thing is, as in the discussions earlier on, you don't have to be a teacher to do it. Maybe as a teacher, with put your teacher hat on, you can look back and see what you're doing. But that's not important. The important thing is just to do it. <laughs> and any activity, whatever you happen to be able to offer, that is something that you can use. Because with Finley's uh, techniques that he was talking about earlier on, the stuff you're using, the physical thing that you're using, that's your guide, that's your prop, that tells you what to do. And that's nice, and that's a lovely thing. So, just to conclude then, as I said at the beginning, this is just an example of things I do. And it's just, just to show that you could probably do anything you liked. And as unusual as, and perhaps unexpected, as something like a Gaelic karate class, it's actually quite easy. And it gives you lots of opportunities to think about how to present the language to people in a way that you might not have thought of otherwise. And the same, I'm sure, would be true for other things. So with that, I think I'm basically on time. So with that, thank you very, very much for listening. Get your miigwech. And there's some stuff if you're interested. <laughs> so, any questions? It doesn't look like there's any questions, so you might be getting your exercise for nothing here, but... <laughs> How much time, have, am I all completely out of time? Do we have maybe five minutes? Right. Volunteers? <laughs> okay, one, two. <laughs> uh, 
Well, let's get, um, I like working in circles. Can we get maybe half a dozen each people? Right in the middle of Just around me here. So put this on your belt, and okay. I will put it on your lapel. Let's see if it works, okay, I will call us. I cope it. Yeah, uh, it seems like it's working. <laughs> Let's see what happens now. Uh, one more thing: Could you put the projector off? Yep. This one. Oh. Going blind here, and I can't see that well anyway. So can we get a, a proper circle here, not sort of a square one? <laughs> so as I was saying earlier on, I like to work in circles to get away from this boot camp kind of thing and also to reinforce the importance of circles in our way of thinking. So anyway, so uh, I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll do a, exactly what I do in the class and you can just follow along and, and you can see how it works. So. Count, count. So, count and encircle. Oh, count and encircle. To veil it. Okay, glaive up. I guess an issue. Garchenen. So, garchenen and encircle. I guess it is. I guess next year, Kruachen. Kruachen. Kruachen an and Kerkel. I guess Tavela Mahurst. Okay. Glunian. And in Kerkel, I guess to Vela Machurst. I guess me at a hall, Oprenen. Oprenen. Okay, Cleva. In Lava Mach. Okay, Hagranjak Dalsuas is Rolikushias of Rai. Graniak dal suas is rolikushi is a vrai. Okay, dal suas agis rolikushi is a vrai. Dal suas agis rolikushi is a vrai. Right, dal suas agis rolikushi is a vrai. Can eh? Kleva. Dal suas agis rolikushi is a vrai. Wow. A dal suas. I guess Rolikushi is a vrai. A dal suas, I guess Rolikushi is a vrai. A dal suas, this Rolikushi is a vrai. A dal suas, I guess Rolikushi is a vrai. Nishtia. Stjachken and towel, machas and towel. A stjachken and towel, a machas and towel. Okay? A stjachken and towel, a machas and towel. Kleva, a stjachken and towel, a machas and towel. 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 A stjachken and towel, a as and towel, a stack and towel, I guess a mach as and towel. Cleva. Nestia. Okay. An ishakaske, I guess, splat. Ishakaske, I guess, splat. 
What's your name? Ray. Ray Escape. <laughs> I guess <laughs> Splat. <laughs> I guess Georgiana Escape. I guess Splat. I guess. So Ray Georgiana. Terry Escape. I guess Splat. I guess. Mita Escape. I guess Splat. I guess. Patricia is gay, I guess splat. I guess Shirley is gay, I guess splat. Missy is gay, I guess splat. Sue is gonna nod, I guess boing. Sue is gonna nod, I guess boing. Sue is gonna nod, I guess oops, I guess boing. So is getting on, boing. So is getting on, I guess, 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 boing. I guess, so is getting on, I guess, boing. I think that's sufficient to show the kind of thing that, that oh, don't run away yet, <laughs> because <laughs> look how quickly they picked up how to say things. So you can imagine if you did that for a lot longer, because children, when they're doing fun things like that, they don't get bored as quick as we do. So they like doing it again and again, and every week kind of thing. And look how quick you picked it up there. So it's a handy way of reinforcing patterns. And all of the things we did, by the way, do have self-defense applications, although it might not have looked it there. <laughs> you know, so you've taught the foundations of things and taught the, well, presented the language, taught the foundations of the thing you're actually trying to teach, and hopefully everybody had a bit of fun. So I think that's probably enough. So thank you very, very much, all of you, for being such willing and able volunteers. So any questions at all or are we a little bass or some cup of coffee? You're dying for a cup of coffee. <laughs> okay, well thank you very, very much and I hope you got something out of that at least. Oh, sorry, there is a question. Do you own a kill? Uh, yes, uh, in fact I have a couple of them. <laughs> Uh, according to my wife, no, but actually I think I'm all right at it. <laughs> yeah, as far as the kilt goes, oh yes, of course I do, because it's, I'm a piper and it's been in my family for generations and generations, and I tend to keep it for sort of formal things and when I'm piping, because that's kind of what you do. Uh, but we do have a big problem with it, and that is that it's been appropriated by people who really don't have any thing to do with the culture. Like the time you tend to see kilts in Scotland is people going to football matches to act stupid. And you know, I, I'd, bug, I'd put up with it because what can I do? But it bugs me because I think if, if they want to act like clowns, well put on big floppy shoes and a red nose. Don't dress up in a kilt. But <laughs> and also, I'm sure you're wondering, most people do in fact wear something underneath it. <laughs> <laughs> Because, like myself, for example, I am under no illusions. I'm sure that the wide world does not want to look at my backside. So, for the sake of politeness, I don't go around like that. And it's gen some people don't. I don't know. But generally speaking, it's people that drink too much and act stupid that go around doing stupid things like that. And I've got no time for that kind of thing. It's a cultural appropriation that bugs me. Oh, dancing is a really big part of the culture, and it's, it's intergenerational too. I think it's a grand thing if you get a traditional sort of dance in the community, because there'll be people there from babies right up to old people, and if, you're, if you can walk around at all, people dance, and there's no connotations or problems with a, a seven-year-old dancing with a 70-year-old. It's just what you do. Um, it's nice too that there's a continuity of knowledge pretty well all over the Highlands. There's a, a handful of sort of Cayley dances, as they're called, that everybody knows. 
So I can go to a, a Cayley in, in the south of, of the Hebrides, like in Barra, or up where Finley's from, and Lewis, and generally they'll do the same kind of dances as I would do at home. So it's really nice, you can fit in really well. Yes. Yeah. I've been pretty fortunate to have some pretty good teachers on that. They haven't been so fortunate in their student, however, but I have some very, very good teachers. Yeah. I, I did sort of think about taking the pipes over and everything, but ugh, I like to travel light, you know, and also there's ivory on them. Oh, they're 150 years old, you know, I didn't harm any elephants recently. In fact, it's sea ivory anyway. But I was afraid with customs and stuff, there can be problems with that. So overall, I thought it was easier just to leave them where they were. <laughs> Pardon me? Oh, Mahvurn. Oh, sorry, I forgot that. Yes, Mahvurn. Yeah, the, the root of the word M-A-O-R refers to some kind of a minor officer of some sort. So, I don't know, uh, Mahvurn, I guess we're descended from that. The Mahvurn. Yeah, and the, what was it going to, oh, the Mak, by the way, it doesn't necessarily just mean son of. It means a derivative of. Like the Gaelic for a single malt is Mach Nebracha a derivative of the barley. Uh, so it's, it's thought to be, it's not quite accurate, it means derived from. And it tends to be a notable person, uh, a religious person, and sometimes it can be a mixture, but those tend to be from, like, like Findlay, McCloich. I'm not sure that there's a clear der derivation of the Loich part in your name, but something like MacDonald, MacGoyle, there is, there's a particular MacDonald that those people the story goes, goes back to, or McGregor's as well, there's a particular Gregor that they all go back to. That's how that works. Although, traditionally in Gaelic society, we didn't use surnames. We used what was called a sloinig, which is, you know, who you're, it could be father or mother, but essentially it was a genealogy maybe three or four generations back. As a member of fell in class asked me a couple of weeks ago, he said, well, how come there's no Gaelic for uncle or aunt? other than a complicated thing, you know, brother's sister, or sorry, what would, uh, you know, brother of my granny or something like that. There's these kinds of things. And he said, well, why? And what I answered was, well, rather than say, isn't it odd that we don't have a word for, what does that tell us about the culture? And if you have a sloinig, as soon as you name the person, you've so told the genealogy anyway, so you don't need it. And generally speaking, people got their names when they bumped into an institution, which was usually the army or the school. Because there'd be a little fella sitting there with a, with a thing, and you've, you've signed up for the regiment, or got signed up for the regiment, and there's a wee box, and he says, right, what's your name? And you say... Uh, Alistair Hallam Gall Akin Vaud. Guy's looking at you, all right, okay. Uh, I've got a wee box and a big long name. Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Tain. Oh, you're a Ross. So it's plonked on them. It's not the traditional name. So it's another, of, we've talked here already about different ways of thinking and different ways of looking at the world. And that's one, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So people would have an awareness of what their clan was, because you do, but you wouldn't necessarily express it in the way the English language thing is. Because uh, it, it was just it was expressed differently. So there's a fair bit of work to do there as well. <laughs> right? Well, there's. Uh, I, oh. I just asked if your language is the same as a Welsh language? It's a cousin language. Uh, there are two branches that go back to a common root. And linguists seem to think that the, the split happened thousands of years ago uh, while the language was still in Europe, perhaps before it had gone to Ireland or, uh, or the British Isles. And on one hand, you've got uh, Welsh, Cornish, and Breton. On the other side, you have Irish, Manx, and Scottish Gaelic. I, I don't know about historical languages, but those are the ones that are alive nowadays. And it's basically a sound change. Uh, for example, 
the Welsh word for five is pump, with a p on either end. Pump. Whereas our word is coik, with a k at either end. So whatever the original sound was, it went to p on one side and it went to k on the other side. And that's basically the difference. I'm told, although I don't know any Welsh, that grammatically, etc., very much alike. It's the sound system. I can't understand a Welshman when I'm speaking to them. But depending on where the person's from in Ireland, I can get on fine. It's kion, a pen. Yeah, kion. Uh, we have a k. Well, in Welsh, uh, pen. we've got a Welshman here. What am I talking about? Yeah, well, p, pen, yeah. Okay then, well, once again, thank you all very much. <laughs>